Probably my favorite author ever is Roald Dahl. It was painful to hear he was really anti-Semitic right up until he died, but I think there's still some ground for appreciating and enjoying his work. But even his books are not all innocent. Have you read Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Not the movies. The movies are too weird for me to enjoy. The book is full of fun and magic, just like any Roald Dahl book for kids, and has a much lighter tone than the movies. Plus, the movies changed the name to Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Not cool movies. Anyway, in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, like its equally fun sequel, Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator, Willy Wonka has slaves. Hmm. Hmm. And it's not just Willy Wonka. Slaves appear in other popular fiction, too. I think we should talk about it. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Oh, and before I go on, a big thank you to St. Andrew for recommending my channel to his subscribers. So I guess he's this week's sponsor. So big hug to you, Andrew, for me. Mm. Good. Now, back to the factory. Why do we, possibly mostly white men, fantasize about working for or being a benevolent capitalist who bestows wonderful gifts onto the world, even though his workers do all the work and are indentured there for life? Why do we believe slaves would or could be happy with their lot? Does the literature reflect the prevailing assumptions of the day? Is there a history behind these things? Hey, what do you know? There is. Slavery is frequently whitewashed in a number of different ways, from making slaves look happy and content with being held in bondage by their paternalistic masters, to framing enslaved women as mistresses instead of what they really were, often rape victims. Damaging tropes like the subservient Tom and ready-to-serve Mammy were created during and after slavery as a direct defense and were hugely influential for decades. The concerted effort to skew the reality of slavery is reflected in movies, school textbooks, and classroom assignments, and has been heard in comments from government leaders like Ben Carson, head of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, and a black man who called enslaved Africans immigrants, saying they came to America looking for a better life for their children. After all, Roald Dahl grew up under the British Empire. Why wouldn't he believe his culture could civilize the barbarians? In fact, we can get specific about how this culture affected his writing. The Oompa Loompas were originally black slaves. The original 1964 edition of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory presented a race of African pygmies from the very deepest and darkest part of the African jungle, where no white man had been before. That phrase was typical of adventure stories boys used to read when Roald Dahl was a kid. Willy Wonka transported the whole tribe out of its native and presumably sacred land. But it's all good, as he explains, because Lumpa Land is a terrible country. They used to live off caterpillars, beetles, leaves, and the bark of the bong bong tree. Now they just eat chocolate. This is how white people during the Age of Imperialism saw Africans. A bunch of silly little demi-humans with funny names who are starving and uncivilized, but who could have so much better lives if we just brought them here. Oh, and I guess put them to work for us. <laughs> In other words, happy slaves. In fact, Wonka even conducts experiments on the Oompa Loompas. What other horrors have been inflicted on Oompa Loompas who didn't know what they were getting into? 
Wonka needs subjects the outside world is not going to know or care about, which characterizes quite a bit of the history of scientific research in Europe. The success of the chocolate factory is due to a blatant act of European colonialism. A capitalist goes to Africa, gathers up an entire tribe, brings them to his factory, and makes them work and get experimented on. Forever. Then he tells the world they were miserable over there, but now they couldn't be happier. Sounds exactly like the kind of story slavers, colonizers, and capitalists have always told themselves to turn their guilt into virtue. From blackgirlscreate.org, the theme of the happy slave in science fiction and fantasy is one that I wish the genre would retire. From the house elves in Harry Potter to the Ood in Doctor Who, writers, usually white, exploring slave races through non-humans tend to feel more like a tool to assuage their guilt over real-world slavery than a means to explore the atrocities of the system in any meaningful way. I expect there are lots of examples of poor taste uses of slaves in fiction. Isn't that the main criticism of Gone with the Wind? But I haven't read or seen Gone with the Wind, so the only other work of fiction with happy slaves I know is Harry Potter. I talked about the boring politics of the Harry Potter series in an earlier video. But here we're talking about slaves. The Potterverse has slaves. They're called house elves. Now, to me, they can't represent real enslaved humans, house elves, because they have no agency and they have no desire to be free, or at least very few of them do. But if they're not there to represent real slaves, what are they there for? From the same article, the way they're presented in Harry Potter, it's as if they were born to be enslaved. A notion that's incredibly dangerous given the society we live in, one that's both historically and contemporarily built on the enslavement of people deemed lesser by those in power. House elves seem to be there just for Hermione to rescue as their white savior. No one else can muster the enthusiasm to end slavery in their midst. Along with the happy slave trope is the accompanying good master trope, as we see the contrast between cruel masters like the Malfoys and benign masters like Dumbledore. But they both employ slaves... Like I say, I don't know of other examples in fiction, but I think I should probably mention Santa. Elves do all his work. They don't leave. Think about it. If you had a company and all your workers worked there full time for life and couldn't get away, what would you call it? A plantation? Maybe a sweatshop? Or maybe you like capitalists, so you would keep calling it a workshop. Seems like a euphemism to me. Maybe the reason these stories don't seem so weird to us is because they're not that different from capitalism, the way it works in our world. We're used to letting people with money do whatever they want in order to make more. Maybe that's why we're brought up on these stories in the first place to condition us to hope to spend our whole lives working for one big benevolent boss. Maybe it's just easier to write about a company that isn't a worker-owned cooperative. I just don't think tone-deaf white people should write about slavery so lightly. Thanks.